So, uh, housekeeping, obviously, uh, my name. So, I'm Prabs. Uh, by background, I'm a pathologist uh, and I'm Director of Clinical Data and Imaging at Genomics England. Um, next slide. So, we have two speakers on today. Uh, as I said, so we've got Narupa, who's going to tell us about um, insights from, uh, from the 100,000 Genomes Programme and the cancer arm in particular. Um, and then Robert Bentham, who we're going to call Bobby, um, but it's inferring T and B cell fractions from whole genome sequencing. Um, okay, next slide. Um, what we also do is these uh, research seminars happen once a month, uh, using the last Tuesday of every month. Um, and we have uh, a great session of speakers coming uh, next month, 25th of July. Um, and those are the list of people that are talking, and it'll be great if you can join us in as well. Okay. Um, oh yeah, sorry, I've also got to tell you about GERS. So um, every year we try and do a research summit um, and we invite um, some guest speakers and we also invite uh, post presentations and abstracts. Um, and this year, this will be on the 19th September, 2023 at the Business Design Centre in London. Uh, registration is free. Uh, and if you click the link there below, uh, you can follow the link to register. Uh, great to see some of you in, pe in person uh, and looking forward to hearing some of the great talks that you'll be seeing. Okay, next slide. Uh, and on to Narupa. So, um, Narupa is a principal clinician for GEL. She's also clinical lead for Southeast GLH, uh, and she's also an oncologist by training. So, Narupa, the floor is yours, and thank you very much for doing this with us. Thank you, Prabs, um, and thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, so what I'd like to really uh, focus on today is to um, provide some insights from the cancer programme from the 100,000 Genomes Project and really focusing in on solid cancers and how I suppose this has shaped um, the genomic medicine service and what we found from the analysis, especially um, when there's been the ability to link the genomic data to real world longitudinal data. So many of you will be aware of this, but just to recap, in terms of the 100,000 Genomes Project and how patients were recruited into the uh, cancer arm, patients were identified by their treating clinicians and then uh, consented into the project and um, samples were collected. So this would be fresh frozen um, tissue samples as well as blood uh, for germline analysis. And um, in, in the case of solid cancers, the DNA was then extracted and then sent for sequencing to Illumina as the sequencing partner. And then uh, there is was an automated pipeline set up within Genomics England for variant calling and interpretation. And I suppose the thing that was also unique uh, from the project perspective is that despite being at this point a research endeavor, um, these results were sent back to clinical scientists for review at the Genomic Medicine Center or um, Genomic uh, Lab Hub so that um, these results could be um, uh, reviewed and um, uh, looked at at genomic tumor advisory boards or molecular tumor boards to see if this would then influence patients uh, care and management. And so um, this is an overview of uh, just under 14,000 uh, um, tumor types. So this is the breakdown of the different cancers that were sequenced. And we can see um, that um, there is a large proportion in the cohort of breast invasive carcinomas, colon ca uh, cancers, as well as rectal adenocarcinomas, sarcomas, lung adenocarcinomas, as well as squamous cell cancers. So this is just to give a breakdown by cancer type. And then also we can begin to see uh, recruitment across the different genomic medicine centers. And um, the, the size of the circle denotes um, how many patients were recruited from the different centers that were involved in the project across England. And then we were able to link the genomic data with cancer registry data or registration data. So we can see uh, what the stage of the cancer was. And we, we see here that the majority of cancers denoted in the dark pink uh, was in fact stage one and then stage two. And this is because, um, and only a small subset in the light pink 
or in fact stage four cancers. And this is because um, the large proportion, um, at the, especially at the outset of the project, were from resection samples um, in order to ensure that there would be adequate DNA for whole genome sequencing. Then going forwards, then there are more, as you can see in green, biopsy samples that were shown to be feasible. And this is important because it's also clinically relevant. And so there are a, a smaller, albeit smaller proportion of cancers which had uh, uh, sequencing from biopsies. And then on the far right um, is the tumour purity, the median tumour purity as it was calculated. And the important point um, that I would like you to take away here is that the pipeline or the sequencing was at 100 fold coverage. And um, this is important, especially in certain cancer types such as lung adenocarcinoma and pancreatic adenocarcinoma, where the median tumor purity can be a lot lower. And therefore, for accurate or sensitive calling, you know, the coverage is important. And I suppose, therefore, the 100,000 Genomes Project laid the foundations for the genomic NHS genomic medicine um, service. And what we um, know is that um, as a result of this, this has then developed the national test directory. And this can be Googled, you can look this up and you can um, look at um, what are the essential tests that should be undertaken for each tumour type based on a nice approved therapy or for prognosis um, in different cancer types. And this is delivered um, at the moment through the seven genomic lab hubs in England. So these are the different regions so that there is standardized and the aim is for equitable access for testing across each region. And this also aligns with the NHS long-term plan and accelerating and embedding genomics into the NHS. So I'm just going to quickly recap how, you know, this on this roadmap of how the um, NHS genomic services working and, and it's you know similar to the journey that I previously described. We have the test directory which stipulates the essential tests that should be undertaken. This is delivered through seven genomic lab hubs. There are standardized pipelines for variant calling and where required cases are reviewed, clinical recommendations are made um, through genomic tumor advisory boards and fed back to treating clinicians. And so due to the development of, and the, um, uh, of the national test directory, we were then able to undertake an analysis uh, looking at the 13,800 plus tumors and how they mapped to the test directory. So what I'm showing here is the total, this is for, again, I stress for solid cancers, the total percentage of tumors with one or more mutations in a target gene as listed in the test directory. And you can see that um, both glioblastoma, low-grade glioma have a large proportion of tumors which are clinically relevant and should be undertaken as testing as part of standard of care. This is, the standard of care is indicated in pink. When we start to look at the types of mutations in more detail, this is quite interesting because we can see that um, this is now looking at SNV indel, so small variants, and this is um, by order here, um, uh, the proportion of or percentage of tumours that have some uh, a small variant of clinical uh, relevance. And what is interesting is that if an example here is pic 3 ca so highlighted now in this red box, vertical box. The indication for testing is in metastatic um, ER positive uh, breast invasive cancers. But we see that PIK3CA is a commonly mutinated oncogene and many of you will be aware of this. But so why this is maybe relevant is that in blue is the, uh, the proportion or percentage of tumours that are have harbour this mutation. And therefore, this may be relevant in terms of potential clinical trials, compassionate early access, or um, and especially trials such as Determine, which are these basket trials that have that is now opened within the UK. So this is the blue really highlights things that aren't in the test directory, but may potentially be actionable. And then we look at um, 
copy number changes. So in the next box, vertical boxes and also fusions. And what we begin to see is that glioblastoma have a large number of copy number aberrations that are clinically relevant. And this may indicate why glioblastoma actually is now within the uh, test directory and is commissioned for whole genome sequencing. Similarly, sarcoma, which is also a, su a subset of cancers for which whole genome sequencing is commissioned, is again because you see a large proportion with you know, where you're trying to capture through whole genome sequencing, structural variants, copy number aberrations, and also um, small variants. And then if we start to look at pangenomic markers, such as HR deficiency, the only one that is in pink is high-grade ovarian, um, high-grade serous ovarian cancers, because um, th then there is an indication if there is an HR deficient tumor for uh, PARP inhibitor treatment. But we can begin to see what the levels of HR are across all the cancer types present in a lower prevalence, but again, may indicate those that are relevant for um, clinical trials, compassionate access. And then there is mismatch repair with a close correlation with TMB. Um, currently, the majority of MMR uh, mismatch repair is called uh, with immunohistochemistry rather than genomics, but this is something that may change going forwards. And then finally, um, we can begin to uh, consider um, germline uh, mutations. So, um, uh, and we can see that there is a number of uh, cancer predisposition genes and pharmacogenomic variants, so this is DPYD, that are also uh, have been identified in this cohort. And I flagged here ovarian um, cancer again because you are able to pick up a pangenomic marker and a pre cancer predisposition gene with the use of a single test. And so coming back to um, then some of the pangenomic analysis we've done, um, the top panel across just a subset of cancers listed at the top here, these six cancers, show the shows their tumor mutation burden and as expected there is a higher burden amongst the uh, lung adenocarcinoma and melan um, cutaneous melanoma and this is because that we know that there are clear mutagens that are responsible in the onset of these um, cancers and then in this middle panel we can look at mutational signatures so the mutational landscape across the tumor and we can see as expected we see here the apobec signature in breast invasive uh, carcinoma, homologous recombination, as I've shown in high-grade serous, but also MMR, mismatch repair, and poly deficiency in endometrial and colon cancer, and in red, the smoking signature and UV light um, exposure in uh, melanoma. So we were able to confirm the signatures and the etiology that have been uh, previously published within the literature, and also identify HR status through um, uh, cord analysis. So this was developed, this is an algorithm that was developed at the Hartwig to identify HR deficient tumors. And then now moving on to, as I uh, mentioned earlier, how this links with clinical data and real world data. What we see is that there is um, linkage with longitudinal life course data. So we have the cancer registry data, we have SACT, systemic anti-cancer therapy, so treatment data and um, survival data from um, ONS data. So Office for National Statistics, or, as well as hospital episodes. So when linking that alongside the genomic data really allows us to then interrogate further the genomic um, uh, analysis and here is um, an example of where and this this uh, data now is all currently in um, submission and under revision uh, with Nature Medicine so we can begin to see that um, in those as we would expect in patients with um, HR deficient tumors if they receive platinum therapy as a surrogate that they their survival is better as we would expect versus HR proficient tumors. And um, when we, th there is a forest plot embedded within the survival curve. And when we um, take 
uh, into account stage by multivariate analysis, we can see that this still remains um, significant. And the number of cases are shown below, and this will be the format for a few more survival curves that I'll be showing. We begin to see this pattern in um, mismatch repair signatures and uh, treatment with immunotherapies. But um, given the small number of cases, as you can see here, this isn't significant, but also useful. Um, I think this indicate as the data set matures, this is something that we, we can continue to look um, at and would be in keeping with the literature. And then we also looked at TMB and patients treated with um, immunotherapy or immune checkpoint blockade. And what is interesting is that in skin mutan uh, cutaneous melanoma, we do see um, an improved outcome um, in those patients with, with a high TMB. Um, this was the highest quartile versus the lowest quartile, and this was significant uh, by multivariate analysis. But um, we don't see that, interestingly, in lung adenocarcinoma. And I think this comes back to the point that TMB, whilst useful, is an imperfect biomarker and certainly will require further refining, um, but based on different cancer types. Another in, uh, area that we were able to look at, because within whole genomes, um, which is more challenging with uh, large panel data, is um, the co-occurrence of copy number alterations. And what is interesting is that when we look at the genes within the test directory for solid cancers, we can see that there is all of these genes were significant um, in terms of sh they showed a significant co-occurrence of um, again in the presence of a small variant. Um, and we see that um, across the oncogenes and as expected, we would we also see that for the tumor suppressor genes in the test directory. And these here we only show the, the um, 12 genes that were significant. What is interesting is that this type of information we don't often have when we look at um, when, when, when we're looking for a particular EGFR mutation or a BRAF mutation in the clinic. And this is important because it may also potentially um, indicate those patients, if they also have a, a gain, a co-occurrence, maybe these are the patients that are more likely um, to respond to a particular targeted therapy. So this is an area that obviously requires more um, work. And then finally, I would like to look at how we were able to look across the um, uh, 40 genes within the test directory and assess how um, um, the presence or absence of this mutation may uh, affect survival. And here I'm showing uh, examples of genes, um, you know, which we are not surprising. These are well-known characterized uh, cancer genes where there is um, here worse survival in the presence of a BRAF mutation, in presence or loss of CDKN2A, um, and also with KRAS. Interestingly, and this is, um, a, is uh, in uh, agreement with the published literature, in tumors that harbored a PIK3CA mutation, they had improved um, survival outcome. And we also see this in P53, the most commonly mutated um, gene across the entire cohort. So um, really what this is beginning to do is we can begin to look now at real world data, survival data alongside this genomic data. And going forwards, there's the real ability to further refine the co-occurrence of mutations and examine this in much more detail to really advance and refine precision oncology. And then, so just quickly to summarize, you know, this is, here's the link to the test directory. These are the different um, uh, types of um, mutations uh, that need to be identified for just for standard of care. And we know that we get a small biopsy to confirm the diagnosis by immunohistochemistry. We then have to look for all these different types of mutations, as well as the pangenomic markers that I've mentioned. Certain cancers, we may need to undertake fish or cytogenetics. And then a blood sample is taken to look for cancer predisposition or potentially 
uh, pharmacogenomics. So DPYD is in the test directory and should be uh, has to be undertaken for any patient who is going to have fluoropyrimidine chemotherapy to look for potential uh, toxicity and potentially life threatening toxicity. And essentially, you can see that there are a large number of tests that need to be done. And what next generation sequencing is enabling is limited number of, of tests and going forward, ideally to have a single test to capture all the clinical and research requirements. Having said all of that, um, I should probably also caveat this with this is going to be dependent on performance, cost, turnaround times, and more and more, I think the a uh, number of tests and the and the volume of tissue that's required will be an important factor to consider in especially when tumors are sampled so just finally i just wanted to summarize with a case this is actually from a case report from the uh, 100,000 genomes project a patient with a diagnosed with a high grade ovarian serous cancer. Many of you will have seen these reports. You have some information about the tumor and some sequencing uh, QC uh, metrics. There was a within the first section is the small variants. P53 mutation was identified. This is in keeping with the diagnosis of high grade serous ovarian cancer. So. Many of my oncology colleagues are used to looking at base pair changes that we, we can identify. But as I've said, we can also then come on to look at changes at the gene level. So here there was loss of the BRCA1 gene. And then when we looked at mutational signatures, there was HR deficiency, homologous recombination deficiency. And then in this particular case, there was also a BRCA1 mutation. So I think I'm just sort of highlighting or emphasizing the point that the single test was able to capture all of that information. And this is a real um, a case where um, this was uh, all of this information was gleaned from a single test. And I think going forwards in terms of future directions, you know, there will be great value in expanding the um, genomic data that is available, the de-identified data that goes into the research environment. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure that many of you are already aware and are using this data. In addition, improvements to the secondary clinical data sources, this has required a lot of work linking all of this. And this, um, this uh, data set will be uh, available in the research environment for everyone to access. And really, as this continues to expand, and I think in the future, there will also be non, the hope is that there will be non WGS data as well. This will sort of enable further clinical research, um, ex, you know, potentially expanding biomarker discovery and new findings, then feeding back in to the um, healthcare ecosystem. So which I think is very exciting, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So thank you very much uh, for your time and very happy to take questions. Okay, uh, we can't applaud in Arupa, but uh, thank you very much for doing the talk. Um, so there are a few questions in the chat. Um, I There has been a hand up for a little while from Zainab. Um, should we start with you, Zainab? I think we can unmute you. Oh, apologies, I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, uh, no need to apologize. That's fine. Uh, my apologies. Thank you for the chat. For the, for the... Oh, okay. No question there. Okay. So um, in the chat, Narupa, there is a question from Michael Miller that says, are there standards for storing genomic data? So NHS England, DHSC, WHO as examples. Um, in terms of, well, obviously the data is um, anonymized and it is a secure data environment. Um, actually, I'm rather than me, perhaps is probably better yeah. place to answer that question, Michael. He's far more aware of all the technical requirements, but obviously th there is an, um, a large amount of um, work that has gone into ensuring that this is a secure uh, data environment. Perhaps, I don't know if you want to to expand on my quite high level answer. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. So Mike, the, the main issue is from a research perspective is that genomic data is labeled as sensitive data, but the attached PID, so NHS numbers, names that we will uh, ingest, that has to be kept separate. And the important bit there from a governance point of view is that 
uh, we swap out um, those NHS numbers for what we call a gel ideal genomic signaling identifier. It's like a clinical trial identifier we allocate to each participant. Um, and that is stored in a secure data server. Uh, and so researchers can only interrogate in the research environment the data set and create their cohorts and run their queries based on effective pseudo anonymized data set. However, there is a separate arm, as Nurupa showed, the kind of the clinical part where we return these results to NHS teams and the GTABs. Uh, that is identifiable, uh, and the clinical teams can um, receive a report that we generate, uh, but that will have participant level data on that. Um, the storage is relatively standardized, so GA4, GH2 have some standards. Um, and then how we saw that in a, in a TRE, a trusted research environment, uh, we follow the principles of HGR UK as well. So we're an accredited TRE as well for research. Um, I hope that answers your question, but I assume there's more to it, but we could probably pick that up and happy to email exchange if you wanted to. Um, okay, so moving on, the next question, Rupert, is from Patrick Morrison. So. Uh, small interesting cohort of uveal melanomas and mesothelial cases, mesothelioma cases, sorry. Were you able to look at germline BAP1 variants? I haven't, but I, I think, think so, it would okay. be um, really, I mean, it would be interesting or useful, I think, to perhaps uh, get in touch with both the GSIP uh, teams, both for mesothelium and because there is a small cohort and there are, you've, I, you know, here I focused on cutaneous because of the test directory. But again, um, I'm sure the melanoma GSIP have been looking at this, so it would be um, uh, useful to liaise with them. And interestingly, Patrick, if you are still on, um, Ben Shum, who is part of the uh, melanoma GSIP, is talking next month at the research seminar, so it might be a good question to pick up there as well. Uh, okay, uh, David Church. Hello, David. Um, Great talk and great data, Nrupa. Have you had a chance to compare the number of actionable targets identified by WGS versus those that would have been detected by standard NGS panels already in clinical use? That's a good question. Yeah, so actually figure two indicates what would or should. Um, I mean, I suppose now going forward, as more and more large panels are being implemented, what should be identified? as standard or, or gold standard and I think the point that I you know wanted to I hope emphasize is that you can see why there is the rationale for a certain sub certain subtypes of cancers but not all cancers because if you're looking at predominantly small variants then as in melanoma for instance you could argue um, that that can all be captured for standard of care via large panels so I, I think the that what figure two, uh, or was figure two, because that's what it is in the paper, what that, that slide did, my complicated slide showing all the different types of variants. And we've got that in more detail in, in um, hopefully, you know, in the paper that's currently in uh, revision, is that what we're trying to show is what would be captured as standard of care, as gold standard, and why certain cancer types, there is the benefit for whole genome because of the different types of mutations. So if you're asking a question, what would be captured from NGS, you can see that quite a large proportion of now, now in the current version of the test di directory, there are quite a large number of actionable variants. Okay, cool. Uh, I hope that answers your question, David. Um, we're probably halfway through um, so if that's okay, um, if there are any further questions, Rupa, please put them in the chat. Um, and you can stay on for a little bit as well. Is that right, Rupa? Yeah, that's, that's fine. Fine. Okay. W awesome. So thank you very much for your time, Rupa. Uh, so the next speaker we have is uh, Bobby Bentham, uh, who's presenting on his work, which is labeled, which is called, sorry, inferring T and B cell fraction from WGS data, which reveals immune dysregulation in circulating blood uh, and and circulating blood cancer. So uh, Robert or Bobby is a senior research fellow um, at Cancer Genome Evolution Group, which led by uh, Nikki McGranahan at UCL. Um, and he first studied at UCL where he did an MSc in mathematics uh, before uh, he completed his uh, MRes in modeling biological complexity and a PhD in bioinformatics. So uh, many degrees Bobby has here, very smart person is as well. Um, so following his PhD, he's worked as a bioinformatician within the target validation team at the Centre for Drug Research and Development uh, in Vancouver, uh, and subsequent returned to UCL for his current postdoc position. 
um, where he's focused on building biomimetic tools to elucidate the role immune system plays in sculpting tumor evolution. Uh, I hope I've done you justice there, Bobby, but the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much um, for the introduction. And yeah, thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, yeah, today I want to tell like a little story about like recent work we've been doing on WGS data and particularly the um, Genomics England cohort to try and infer T and B cell content um, from just WGS samples and also what that has like told us about um, cancer evolution and dysregulation of the immune system. Um, so to get started, um, before I move on to WGS, this project um, originated in a previous study we published on whole exome sequencing. And we're the Cancer Evolution Lab. We do lots of work on tumor copy number. And we had an initial observation that there were many um, breakpoints we detected in our, the cohort we are working on, which is the TraceX uh, lung cohort. Uh, within the T-cell receptor alpha or the TCRA uh, locus. Um, so we detected these frequently. Um, they were being called as either ray focal amplifications or deletion events. And I mean, that was interesting in itself, but it didn't really make any biological sense as this is not um, something you would ex expect to be expressed um, on a cancer cell, um, not in a lung cancer cell. And there was no kind of... Um, expectation that this would be selected for an evolution. Um, what we did um, realize, however, um, was that instead of being a signal from the cancer cells, this was a deletion event. Um, we were, in fact, picking up from T cells also sequenced um, in our sample. Um, so just to go through the um, what we were seeing. So when looking at copy number, we sequenced a tumor and a matched germline blood sample. Um, so this kind of diagram here, this is meant to be like DNA, and these are reads aligning to, aligning to the section of DNA um, in either above its tumor, below is uh, blood. And this is kind of zoomed in on the location, if you imagine it, where TCIA is. And during VDJ recombination, where it's effectively a deletion event within T cells, we're getting fewer reads aligning to that locus. So if you have um, more T cells in your the matched germline blood sample than the tumor. Um, we were reading this as a, a kind of a gain event um, in our tumor sample, which of course was incorrect. Um, but when we looked at this uh, read depth ratio on this local and whole exome sequencing data, we saw a very clear signal that aligned exactly to where the V and J segments were. So it's, it's really clear um, VDJ recombination. And sometimes we had another situation where there were so you had a very highly um, infiltrated um, sample with lots of T cells in the tumor, but not so many T cells in the matched blood. We would interpret this as a loss event. Um, so here you see a dip in the V-depth ratio, uh, but gain centered on the location of VDJ recombination. Mm -hmm. So this is interesting in itself as it kind of explains um, a sort of a signal which you would not maybe expect to see in copy number data. Um, but what we decided to do at this point um, was to develop a tool um, to turn the signal into kind of a measure of T cell content within a whole exome sequencing sample. So we did a lot of work on this. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but it's uh, been published a few years ago now. And interestingly, it was like we found it was very predictive of CPI response and really useful um, in data sets um, without any orthogonal immune data. Um, so you can maybe see where this is leading to there's a particular WGS data set we all are familiar with, which does not have any orthogonal immune data. Um, so this was published, available to researchers on GitHub. And as I've also been working on Genomics England as part of the lung and hand cancer GSIPs, we were interested in adapting this method for WGS. And that is what we have been doing if I go forward one. So we now have a new tool for WGS called Immune Site Estimation from Nucleotide Sequencing or Immune Lens. And what it in effect does is the same concept of the whole exome sequencing data, um, but we've applied it not just to TCRA, but all three uh, T-cell receptor loci, uh, beta and gamma as well. 
and also IGH for B cell content. And the power of WGS is um, if I just go back for an instance, you'll see with whole exome, there's lots of gaps in coverage, and this is very dependent on exome capture kit. Some capture kits you have more coverage in the TCR8 locus than other. Um, WGS data, as long as um, the reference sequence is good and we can align reads, we have even coverage throughout the, the loci. And because of this even coverage, we could fit a much more sophisticated model to estimate T and B cell content. Um, so we made the model um, kind of match up to where we knew the breakpoints would be. And so we knew after each uh, fee segment, there might be a dip in coverage. So we were testing basically to see if there was a dip in coverage. From this, not only did we get T cell fraction estimation, um, but also um, v and J segment proportions. And importantly for IGH B cell, there's a second deletion event um, called class switching, um, which we can estimate the fraction of um, to try and get a say, proportion of the IgG or IgA uh, producing B cells. And in addition to all this, as well as um, from the segment data, we've also been looking at um, how, how well can we actually tell um, what the TCR diversity, like if we look at the repertoire of these samples, like how much information can we get from this, from the V and J segment predictions? Um, so that's a really quick overview of the method. Um, now I'm just going to talk about the validation work um, we've done as, of course, like driving any bioinformatics method, you want to, like, in detail validation, make sure it's worked. And to do this, we use the Trace X100 data set, uh, which we're very lucky to work with. And that has um, extensive matched data for not just whole genome sequencing, it's mainly whole exome. It's also got RNA seq and some TCR seq data, which has been very useful in um, testing this tool. And as you can see, the WGS version can do a lot more than our previous um, whole exome version. Um, so let's just go through a few kind of results to make you believe it works. So this is comparing the WGS versus the whole exome sequencing scores for TCI T cell fraction in either the blood or tumor samples from Tracer X. There's a strong correlation, which is good, but what's important to note is we have much more sensitivity um, to detect lower T cell fractions. So before there was a bias in the whole exome sequencing version, where if it's very low, it would often get round to zero because of uh, noise in the data. Um, this isn't so much of an issue in WGS. We're much more um, confident that we can measure low T cell content in these samples. Um, why are we so confident? Well, one of the reasons is that we get a very clear correlation from RNA-seq uh, gene set signatures um, for T cells. So this is from a, a gene set from this paper um, by Danaher so a few years ago for uh, T cells. Um, this is a stronger correlation than we saw in whole exome sequencing for that version of the score. So this is clearly a signal of T cell content um, within a WGS sample. Um, apart from TCRA, if say if something's happened in the tumor sample on the chromosome 14, where TCRA is, is it's a chromophrypsis event, it could be very hard to get a score out of that tumor sample. Um, but luckily, we now have two additional new scores um, on chromosome seven, different genomic locations from TCRB and TCR gamma. And yeah, this these also correlate strongly with the uh, RNA seq scores. So we have three scores we trust that are related to T cell content. Um, and of course, I mentioned we now also have B cell fraction. So this is quite a nice example from the Tracer X 100 cohort. So this is kind of one of the outputs um, of this method of the a uh, log V depth ratio, different colors indicate different predicted uh, V or J segments. On the right is the VDJ deletion event. Um, on the left is the class switching um, deletion event. So this is a sample with like a high proportion of B cells are in fact class switched, um, over 80%, uh, mostly predicted to be IgA uh, B cells. And this is also a highly uh, B cell infiltrated case of almost a quarter. Um, well, 0.25 uh, fraction is, is predicted to be B cells. And finally, or not quite finally, on the validation, we can look at uh, diversity. So this is kind of just a cartoon 
of what could be possible in the future. But this is the standard output from the model um, of this is like different um, TCRA V segments that are used size due to proportion. So you can create these kind of visualizations. Um, also, you can do the same thing for B cells. And there from there, you, could, uh, you can calculate um, more like detailed TCR diversity metrics, which we are currently still testing. Um, this raises the question, how good is our V and J segment prediction? Um, we're very confident in the T cell fraction is accurate and the B cell fraction is accurate. Um, but the one of the limitations of this method is it is not trying to reproduce uh, TCRC data. Um, we can't have the ability to like sequence uh, tens of thousands of uh, CDR free sequences. Um, we're working with WGS data, a particular depth, and it's a prediction. Um, so this plot um, shows match data from tracer X of uh, TCR seq, and the V segments are divided into quartiles based on their portion. And on the Y axis, we have the segment portion that's estimated from our model. Um, good news, the higher proportion segments are on average uh, predicted at higher value. Uh, bad news, the medium for all four groups is zero. Um, so we're still um, really underestimating the diversity of T cells from this method. Um, so it's useful in cases where you don't have any other information on uh, TCR diversity, um, but it is in, in no means a replacement for it. Um, so that is kind of the overview of the method. Um, so the other thing to I want to highlight is this is very computationally quick to do. Um, it's very easy to apply on any WGS sample. It can be run independently on germline blood or a tumor uh, sample. And we've applied this to the 100,000 uh, genome project on Genomics England. And from this, we have this um, suddenly this immune landscape um, of both tumor infiltrating and circulating T and B cells. So this is kind of just the overview plot for the cohort we have. Um, for T cells, it's ordered by the medium fraction we see in circulating blood. And it's, it's a very large cohort as that we suddenly have over 15,000 participants. Most of these do have matched blood control. This is not um, universal across the entire cohort. And we also have, which isn't shown on this graph, a normal cohort um, composed of uh, blood samples from rare disease relatives, which we can use as kind of a comparison to the uh, circulating blood scores we have in the cancer patients. Um, and I would say the, there is some orthogonal immune data for a subset of rare disease participants that have blood count data, which I will be talking about in a second. Um, here's a similar graph. Uh, this is the landscape of infiltrating and circulating B cell uh, content we see in the genomics England cohort. Um, in this one, we've kind of a group of dummies pie charts so they highlight the class switching we see in the different um, cancer types. And also, I think one thing, and the size of the pie or the chart is proportional to the median value we see in that cohort. So we see fewer B cells in circulating blood than we do in tumor infiltrating, um, which is the opposite of what we see for T cells, where T cell counts is typically higher in the blood. Um, so I just mentioned that we have some date matched uh, WGS uh, blood count data from the 100,000 genome project for a subset of the rare disease cohort. So these are uh, participants who on the date, um, they had the WGS sample collection also had blood count data, um, which we can match up. It's not a large number, but it was enough to do like another uh, kind of orthogonal validation on Genomics England. And I think what we were, um, interested in here is we didn't have any blood count data in trace X, because we saw a strong correlation with lymphocyte count, which is what uh, we expected to see. We also saw a strong negative correlation with neutrophil count. Um, so the more neutrophils um, in circulating blood, um, when you take that for WGS sequencing, the fewer um, T or lymphocytes or T cells will also um, get sequenced. And what this means is the measure we are actually calculating uh, T cell fraction in blood is strongly correlated like rho of 0.82 with the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, which is a very well-established um, biomarker for 
uh, prognosis in many, many different conditions. Um, yeah, so um, that's kind of been a quick introduction to the cohort we have. And now I just want to say like one bit of analysis we have done on this cohort to kind of try to show its powers. Like there's been lots of pan cancer immune landscape in terms of infiltrating T cells. Uh, we thought there's kind of a gap in people who've looked at circulating T cells in such a, a large cohort. So we were, we were interested in this and we used this uh, normal cohort um, from their disease relatives as kind of a comparison to what is going on in the cancer participants. And the most striking thing we saw was that um, in the cancer uh, participants, there was a large sexual dimorphism where males had lower T cell fraction um, in circulating blood than females. Um, you might also notice that the levels in both females and males are lower than what you would see in the normal cohort. And this um, possibly is linked to like neutrophil count uh, levels, um, though we're not entirely sure. And we can divide this up by cancer type and the effects of circulating TCI, T cell fraction. So this is uh, showing the uh, Wilcoxon um, effect size is significant across multiple different um, cancer types. Um, and also this effect between cancer and normals, um, when we also propensity natural both age and sex, so there's um, comparable as possible, seems much more uh, universal across all cancer types with only a few such as I think, if you can see uh, the effects isn't very really strong in say like prostate adenocarcinoma, um, and it's very strong in glioblastoma. Um, interestingly, in infiltrating T cell fraction, we don't really see this effect um, with the one notable um, exception of uh, lung adenocarcinoma, um, which was interesting to us because we're very much focused on lung cancer. And um, as a side note, we actually originally spotted this effect on our whole exome sequencing data in lung and just assumed it was universal, which um, turned out not to be the case at all. Um, yeah, and Finally, just as a final thing that we want to show with this data set, we want to see, we want to ask how does um, this link to survival outcomes, which are available on genome and Um So these are Kaplan-Meier curves showing five-year survival um, divided by um, high and low uh, T or B cell uh, fraction groups based on the median value across the entire cohort. And what we were expecting to see here was like highly significant or high significance for infiltrating T cells. Um, as intuitively, we thought, okay, these are the T cells that are um, able to recognize neoantigens and kill cancer cells. But what we saw the most strong association was actually circulating T cells um, in the blood, in and also a similar um, trend in B cells. Um, this was initially surprising for us. Perhaps it shouldn't have been so surprising when you think of general information, which this is uh, likely a signal of, which is known to be prognostic. And um, if you're familiar with the literature, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio is also known to be prognostic of survival. Um, but what's what we found really interesting is this is using the same bioinformatic method, the same technique, and it shows that. Using the same WGS kind of data, we find a stronger effect in the blood than infiltrating T cells. And as a little, I guess the next bit, so a little extra, we divided the B cells into whether or not they were class switch or not. And we only found significance for the B cells in the non class switch, uh, either IgM, D, uh, B cell fraction. Um, we're, we have, we're not quite sure what is going on here, but for whatever reason, naive B cells seem to be a stronger predictor um, or strongly associated with prognosis and survival outcomes. Um, we've also um, done this analysis more in a more sophisticated way with uh, Cox proportional hazard models uh, to control for like confounding effects of age, sex, stage, um, as ancestry, and whether or not they receive chemotherapy pre uh, surgery and sample collection. Um, because as you can imagine, chemotherapy has an effect on um, the immune count you then measure. Um, and, but what we do find on the top um, row is that circulating T cell fraction is associated with survival across multiple um, cancer types. And what we then did was we divided um, the cohort into different groups, either low and high TMB or males and females. 
and we can see some like striking effects. I just want to highlight a few things. So I already told you about this sexual dimorphism in circulating T cells. Um, we're very interested that in certain cancers, such as lung adenocarcinoma and bladder cancer, we're only seeing associations with survival and circulating T cell fashion in females and not males. Um, so we, we don't know why this is happening, but this effect is very strong. And also dividing um, by TMB, um, we, also, we also find it interesting in a few cancer types, such as, again, bladder, and in this term, case, colorectal adenocarcinoma. Uh, the circulating blood cell fraction is only like highly associated with survival um, in the high TMB group, um, which makes us wonder is maybe this isn't just a signal of general information. Um, we're wondering is are these T cells actually able to recognize neoantigens and uh, stop the spread of cancer, which is a hypothesis we are um, thinking about, although right now we do not have um, more evidence to investigate that. Um, so I think I just want to summarize um, uh, what I've talked to you about today. So I hope you've, um, I've shown you our new method for inferring TMB cell content, content from WGS. Um, hopefully I've shown like, or demonstrated that you trust this from our validation work. And hopefully you think that this could be very useful um, for your own analysis on Genomics England. Um, we do have a paper in submission currently, but we want to make these TMB cell um, fractions available on the research environments to all gel users. And uh, we, think, we think there's a lot of interesting biology there, more than I could talk about today and much more than like we've done so far. And we just hope this will be a very good research or resource for all of Genomics England. And I just want to end on my acknowledgements. Uh, everyone in uh, my group has helped me as well as the, the Glenna Handel and Swanton Labs, and of course the Genomics England and Trace X Consortium and all patients and their families. Thank you. Okay, Bobby, thank you very much for that. Um, applause if anyone in the audience would like to as well. But um, if it's okay, if you want to put questions in the chat, feel free or raise your hands. Um, do you mind if I just kind of go back a step, Bobby, to your... Uh, yeah. Uh, no, yeah. actually to your 2001 Nature paper. So at the end of it, yeah. you raised some interesting points. Mm. So it's unrelated to cancer technically, but the distinction from your W WES with uh, kind of cancer reactive T cells and bystander T cells. Do you think mm. you've got a clear answer about the WGS? And the yeah. second question, and mm. the second question, which is completely unrelated to cancer, but is related to newborns, is you also suggested that uh, from the WES data, you think that it might be a useful screening tool for uh, combined mm. immunodeficiency disease in newborns. So, Gel is also kind of launching a newborn screening mm. program. So it'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on how you think that's also an evolution as well. Yeah, um, for the bystander question, that's a very interesting point. We've not, um, it's difficult to do with just T cell fraction as it is. You kind of need to know maybe like the CDR3 um, sequences to kind of like, if it's like clearly binding to like a viral epitope. Um, so I, I think it's it's hard to know um, currently. I think there's a few cases where maybe there's low TMB, high T cell fraction. You can have, ask questions. Okay, maybe these are um, majority bystanders. Um, but right now, the method I think isn't quite well prepared to answer the question between um, bystander and uh, non-bystander. I mean, we want one thing we wanted to look at is expansion of a particular phenotype, which we think we might be able to get from the TCR diversity metrics. Um, but that is still um, very much a work in progress. Um, for the newborn screening, um, I agree. I, we haven't um, done much work on that yet. So that's more like a hypothesis still that we think it could be useful. But yeah. it's, okay. it's still yet to do. I'm not sure if um, there's any cases on the rare disease um, cohort we could even test that out on. It's, it's definitely interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, are there any questions in the chat or any hands up? Let's have a look. Uh, no. Okay. Um, if that is the case, I might give everyone a couple of minutes back of their time. Um, so to Narupa and to Bobby, thank you very much for joining us today and for your presentations.
Um, San and Sam from the research management team, thank you for hosting and arranging this as well. Uh, and for everyone who's joined us online, thank you all for joining us. And uh, one last reminder, if you can join us in person at the uh, GERS Research Summit in September, please do. Uh, I'm sure Zan and Sam can share you details about how to join uh, and hope to see you all there. Thank you all very much uh, and enjoy your two minutes of peace in, in advance. See you all later.